So very good afternoon, uh, dear students. Uh, in continuation with the previous lecture on uh, the the various concepts of import and export and the terms of payment and then the ways uh, various ways in which we uh, fix prices. So in the same line, uh, we also I also made a reference uh, to various documents that were very very necessary. I told you that the commercial and the regulatory set of documents are extremely necessary and it and it must accompany the goods that are going to be exported so here i'm going to talk to you about um, the step-by-step -step procedure of how an exporter can go about exporting goods to an importer uh, as soon as he has uh, received an order from the importer okay uh, so the first step uh, that needs to be taken by an exporter is to open a current account in any one of the scheduled banks which deals with foreign exchange right of course uh, you will be having your account right now in any of your uh, in any of the commercial banks but you must uh, be able to know whether that commercial bank is also operating uh, you know deals with foreign exchange or operates uh, in uh, foreign exchange transactions if so then you can uh, ask for that particular addition to be made to your account so there's not pretty much nothing uh, nothing much that you do there uh, but if in case if it does not operate then you might have to open a, a fresh account um, with any one of the scheduled banks that operates with uh, that operates in foreign exchange uh, transactions. Secondly, uh, you must obtain an import export code number from your regional uh, licensing authority or uh, director of uh, director general of foreign trade uh, under the Department of Commerce. So the import export code number gives you a certain uh, exclusive right and it also is uh, uh, it's a registration number that can always be tracked later and it also gives you a certain uh, you know identity that you are enrolled as a import exporter uh, under the government so it's legally um, you know in under operation the third thing that you need to do is you need to register with uh, any one of the export promotion agencies so we have the export promotion council then we have the commodity boards that uh, deal with various commodities like spices rubber tea uh, and so on and uh, export development authority and uh, obtain from them a registration come uh, membership certificate it's called the rcmc certificate so uh, if you are very keen on exporting then that's something that you need need to do because you need to keep in touch with these uh, promotion agencies register with them become a member attend meetings and also keep getting a lot of material uh, with respect to the various activities that are organized and conducted by these export promotion agencies because these agencies will um, give you the contacts of importers or will also talk about various uh, you know export promotion activities that they undertake and you could al always benefit uh, as a firm so once that's done get the names of the importers and correspond giving details of your product uh, information of ex importers can be uh, obtained from the export promotion council commodity boards export development authority and director general of commercial intelligence and statistics and the high commissions and so on so uh, all these various agencies that deal with uh, foreign countries foreign embassies and uh, also do have uh, contact with importers and uh, so if you do not know a particular uh, importer that you want to deal with now this is in the case of a systematic approach when you are uh, trying to get into international business and you're trying to export your goods and services to a foreign importer but you do not know anybody in a foreign country so in that case by being a member of these export promotion agencies so these agencies will maintain a database or they will have contacts of various importers uh, you know through to whom you through whom you can uh, i mean uh, through these agencies you can contact the importer and then you can establish your uh, business you can you know get on with the negotiations and then finally conclude the transaction and then uh, finally export goods and services so you can get in touch with the importer uh, send in all the necessary details and then uh, you can furnish the order at a later stage so if you receive a reply uh, then you send a quotation so if there is an importer you get in contact with the importer and the importer is interested in what you are uh, selling and would want to do business with you then you can send them a quote so when you are sending a quotation the following things needs to be included uh, so the quotation must uh, discuss about uh, at what prices you're going to be selling your goods so that is what we were discussing in the last a lecture video whether the prices are going to be fixed on free on board or cif and uh, you know uh, whether it's c and f uh, carriage and forwarding or free alongside so 
you got to discuss on uh, what pr pricing point are you fixing the uh, prices of the exports that you're going to be selling to the importer secondly what is the period of delivery so within how many after after receiving the order within how many uh, months are you going to be delivering the order so that needs to be decided third is what is the mode of payment uh, we also discussed about the different modes of payment whether it's an open whether it's an <clears throat> whether it's by an advance payment or whether it is by uh, a letter of credit or whether it is by a bill of exchange or whether it's by uh, document uh, documents uh, you know shipping documents that you're going to uh, uh, deal with how would that be enough so you're going to be discussing the different modes of payment and then finally deciding which particular mode of payment is favorable for both the importer and the exporter the fourth uh, you'll have to discuss about the packing and the specifications so what for the goods that you are going to be dispatching uh, what kind of material are you going to use what is the kind of inner packing what's the kind of outer packing and how are you going to ship it and all those details will have to be discussed at length and then what is the commission or discount that you are granting for the goods that you are selling what is the rate at which you sell in your country and what is the rate that you have fixed to sell in the foreign country and then what is the kind of discount that you are giving and and there should also be something uh, with respect to uh, ensuring that the importer is very happy with the price and would want to place more orders in future so there must be some a promotional aspect also attached with the pricing that you are going to be fixing and six we need to talk about arbitration clause just in case uh, <clears throat> there is going to be a dispute uh, which particular country's laws are we taking into consideration <clears throat> for uh, settling the dispute or uh, any sort of issue that can occur at a later stage so arbitration uh, jurisdiction is what you're going to be talking and jurisdiction will be according to which particular country's laws and any other clause that you think is very important uh, for this trade negotiation or uh, for this trade deal uh, you can decide so all this is going to be sent through the quotation and uh, along with the quote you can also send uh, them a sample of a good so that's also uh, another way by which uh, the importer will get to not just go through the details but also check the sample of your good and then uh, if he's interested then they will place an order so if the quotation is acceptable the importer will place an order so once the order is placed then you are going to start the uh, manufacturing of the goods and preparing the goods to be uh, ready for exports <clears throat> so once your goods are uh, ready then you send them for quality control and inspection so you send them for quality checks and once the quality checks is done are done then you're going to uh, then the quality uh, agency is going to fix uh, uh, a mark of the isi or if it's an agricultural commodity they're going to give you ag mark or any other uh, <clears throat> quality specification uh, that needs to be taken care for respective goods are going to be done by the respective controlling agency and they will affix their uh, quality seal on the good to ensure that the good that has been uh, sent in for inspection is fit for quality and it is uh, absolutely good and uh, can be is ready for consumption. So once that part is done, you send the goods to the port. So once the goods are manufactured and then it goes for quality inspection, once all that is checked, then the goods are ready to be cleared. So it's going to be sent to the port and you, you, you will have a set of agents called the clearing and forwarding agents. So C and F agents is what we call them. So you're going to send it to the clearing and the forwarding agents. So it's a responsibility to the clearing forwarding agents to send it to the customs and then get the necessary clearances from the customs and uh, through verification and inspection and find out that the good that is going to be exported uh, is exported legally. So you or the CNF, the, the clearing and the forwarding agents must file the shipping bill, uh, the GR form with the customs. So both these things are going to be done. If the good is going to be uh, sent to a certain destination, the shipping bill will be the bill that is given to you by your shipping company, which says that you have booked the this uh, you know you booked the cargo on this particular vessel and the bill that has been given so that is there and the gr form will help you to uh, you know get the foreign exchange so in whichever currency the foreign importer is going to pay you so that you get your uh, foreign currency uh, repatriated after the importer pays up for the orders that uh, he has placed so once all that is done customs officials are going to inspect and uh, verify and if everything is found to be proper in place if the documents are proper the goods are proper uh, if everything is uh, you know legal enough and if they are satisfied then they are going to give an order called let ship 
So customs will clear your goods and they will give you an order called let ship or let export. And with that, with the let ship and the let export uh, order or advice, uh, now your goods are ready to be um, loaded onto the ship. So whichever was the shipping vessel or the shipping company that you have booked and whichever is going to go to that particular destination. So once that order is cleared, then the goods can be loaded from the port onto the uh, ship. After accepting the goods on the board of the ship, the captain or the commanding officer of the ship will issue a receipt called the mate receipt. So once the goods are loaded onto the ship, the captain of the ship will give you a receipt called the mate receipt, which is a guarantee that the good has been loaded onto the ship. And you pay the requisite port charges, uh, whatever is applicable for the goods uh, there and for whatever uh, facilities that you are availing. So you done, you done. And with that, you will have a set of documents. So you can you can prepare your documents. So whatever you have done so far will be the uh, set of receipts and documents that you have with you will be the set of documents that is going to say that these goods are ready for export. So these are the set of documents that you would uh, you would have generated by now. So one is a commercial invoice, so which is going to be containing the the list of items, the quantity and the price at which your goods are going to be uh, dispatched. So the commercial invo invoice has to correspond with the goods that are loaded onto the ship. Secondly, you get, you get the GR form which is issued by the RBI uh, form in PP, parcel post or electronic post or cash on delivery. So whatever is the uh, you know mode of payment by which the foreign exchange is going to come to you or uh, the sale of the proceeds uh, is going to come to you is going to be uh, filled in that particular form. Uh, so third will be the certificate of origin, which is issued as to from which particular country this is, um, you know, that the goods are uh, being exported from. Fourth is the certificate of origin under GSP. GSP stands for a, a general system of preferences under the World Trade Organization. A group of countries are given uh, a status called a GSP status, which is a, a, a preferential uh, status that is given to certain countries. So the goods that are coming from GSP is well have a lot of uh, tariff advantages and they will uh, and there will be more preference that are given uh, for exports of goods from these countries and then you'll have a marine insurance policy uh, and then you have ECGC uh, a policy that's given to you by the export credit guarantee council and then you have the mate receipt uh, uh, mate receipt or the bill of lading is what's given to you by the ship shipping company bill of lading as well as the commanding officer has given you a receipt called the mate receipt say, stating that the goods are uh, boarded onto the ship and he's in custody of the goods and then you have the letter of credit and then you have the documents uh, of export and then you have the bill of exchange that you have raised uh, so that through which your uh, you know once your goods are uh, uh, taken custody by the importer importers uh, mode of trans payment is going to be done so what is the mode in which you will be collecting all of that is going to be explained so letter of credit and bill of exchange as i told you is an instrument is a payment instrument that is issued by the importers bank uh, on the basis of which uh, you know you are uh, you can be uh, you can feel uh, confident that the transaction will definitely take place and there is no way the importer can deny because the bank has stood the guarantee the importer's bank has stood guarantee that the as soon as the goods are going to be received or the title of goods are going to be received by the importer the bank will release payment as such and certificate of quality control that's given to you by the authorities isi agmark any other exclusive quality control and inspection, uh, you know, seals had to be maintained. So that's there. And then the shipping bill uh, that you have uh, secured for, uh, you know, the bill from the company or that vessel uh, shipping company that has, that has taken your goods and uh, taken the responsibility to ship your goods to this particular destination. So all of these are going to be the documents. So uh, documentation, as I told you, commercial documents and regulatory documents, all of these are commercial, a part of it will be commercial documents and part of it will be regulatory documents. So these documents, uh, you know, uh, copies of these documents can be dispatched to the importer, can be dispatched to the importer uh, the moment all of this is ready. So even before your goods have uh, left the port of your country, you can dispatch these uh, documents to the importer. So once the uh, the documents will reach, the documents uh, will reach the uh, importer much before the goods reach uh, the importer because the goods will take some time to set sail on the sea and then finally reach the destination. So, but once these documents are dispatched and uh, these can be dispatched electronically or in physical form, whichever way, but electronically it is uh, a lot more faster. So within a few minutes 
of uh, scanning these documents and uploading them and then sending them across uh, via email as an attachment or any other form. The documents are received by the importer. Once the uh, importer goes through, verifies uh, the contents of these documents, then he can be satisfied that yes, uh, everything has happened legally and the goods have definitely set sail. So if in case there is a terms of agreement staying, saying that uh, a payment at a documentary site is going to be there or as soon as we receive uh, copies of the documents, the payment can be released. So if that is the kind of, kind of a per, uh, payment clause that is established, then the importer, as soon as he receives the documents, the moment he sees the documents, it's called documents at site, uh, the moment he sees the documents, then he can uh, give orders or instructions to his bank to release payment. So if that particular uh, negotiation is there, then that can possibly happen. So you send the shipping uh, advice to the importer. Uh, you know what, what are the ways in which you are, uh, you've, you know the uh, the various ways in which your goods need to be taken care and handled, and how it needs to be unloaded from the ship in the importer's port, and how it needs to be carried, what temperature it needs to be carried, all of the uh, uh, what temperature it needs to be kept safe. All of that is going to be, uh, I mean, the, those details are going to be sent to the uh, importer. And then once the uh, importer receives the receives the goods, then the proceeds uh, get the then the then he's going to instruct uh, his bank to release uh, payment. And once that is done, the exporter can go to his bank and collect the uh, proceeds of the export. And then once you have received the proceeds of the exports, then you can uh, go and apply for duty drawback or for any other concessions that uh, you were aware, that you were eligible as an exporter from any of the government agencies any of the export agencies where you have paid up and if there is a if there is a provision of refund then you will be eligible for provision of refund and then you can export calculate the export prices based on marginal cost and that will determine uh, the kind of um, you know the exchange rate at which your goods were sold and then uh, what is the kind of profits that you have made by the sale of these uh, by the export of these goods so that's how the procedure actually goes. So let's look at all of these uh, documents in detail. <clears throat> so what's a commercial invoice? So it is the seller's bill for the goods uh, and sets forth the terms of sale. Uh, and the invoice will contain the name of the buyer and the seller, the order of the contract, which is the order number, the description, quantity of goods, the various items, and uh, cost per item, and then the total quantity that has been uh, uh, you know that has been uh, sent for export and then the total price all of that is going to be there which is typically like a, a bill that you get along with the goods second as i told you the mate receipt uh, when the cargo is loaded onto the ship the commanding officer of the ship will issue a receipt called the mate receipt so this is offered this is a receipt that is given to you by the captain of the ship which is a guarantee that the goods have been loaded onto this particular ship and the ship and the captain of the ship is giving you a receipt giving you a receipt which is a proof that the good is loaded onto this particular ship only. Third, you have something called a bill of lading. So it's a document issued and signed by the shipping company acknowledging that the goods mentioned in the bill have been duly received for shipment and undertaking the delivery of the goods uh, in the like order. So which is it's going to be given to you by the shipping company which operates a particular a ship or a vessel that is going to go to this particular destination. So that particular shipping company has taken up the responsibility to export your goods to the foreign country. So uh, they give you a, a, a document called the Bill of Lady. So if your goods are not going by sea, uh, then you have another bill called the Airway Bill. So if the goods are going to be sent by air and if you're using a air cargo, then you get an Airway Bill. Then the fifth document is a bill of exchange. It's a document of payment uh, for the goods exported. So it is, it is a, as I told you, it's a payment instrument. A bill of exchange is raised by an importer uh, through his importer through his bank, and the bank obviously will share that as a share it with the exporter's bank, and then uh, the banking, uh, you know, channels will take care of the transaction. So uh, that's where uh, there is guarantee that the goods will definitely that the payment will be made as soon as the terms and conditions of the import and export are taken care. Another way by which we uh, settle payments is a method called the letter of credit. It's a letter that is issued by the overseas importer's bank addressed to the exporter or its uh, you know, Indian corresponding bank for the payment provided that the exporter meets all the terms and conditions. So letter of credit is a, a guarantee that is 
given by an importer's bank stating that once the goods are well received by the importer then the bank will release payments so uh, bill of exchange and letter of credit both are going to be instruments so bill of exchange is more like a promissory note letter of credit is a is is more of a document of guarantee wherein the bank involves itself and then uh, it sufficiently gives proof that yes uh, you know i am taking the responsibility to make the payment on behalf of the importer if the terms and conditions are fulfilled And then we have a, a certificate called the certificate of origin that is issued by the chamber of commerce so the exporter has to obtain a certificate of origin from any recognized chamber of commerce or any trade association which has been duly certified by the government of india so that uh, is a document that states from which country are these goods originating then the eighth document will be the certificate of origin and the gsp as i told you this comes under the generalized system of preferences so exporters who ship goods to developed countries which have agreed to give tariff concessions to certain goods that come from certain countries so that preferential treatment or tariff uh, treatment that is going to be given so which means they want to uh, through their bilateral uh, negotiations they would have identified or world trade organization would have uh, encouraged certain developed countries to uh, export goods uh, to import goods from certain uh, countries which really um, need to come on to that uh, international business map so to give them such kind of preferences though they, there is an exclusive a document called the certificate of origin under gsp and then uh, you need to obtain a marine insurance a marine insurance policy is a contract between the insurer and the insured whereby the former is the consideration of the payment of a premium by the latter uh, so in, in short what it means is you are taking insurance for the goods that are going to be exported on the sea so uh, so that is going to be uh, uh, goods are going to be insured by an insurance company which is going to take up the responsibility so you take insurance for the goods and you also are pre paying a pre premium so just in case anything goes wrong uh, anything happens on the sea and if the goods are lost or if the goods uh, um, are damaged because of the perils of the sea uh, in that case you will uh, you can apply for insurance and since you have a marine insurance so uh, you will get a certain portion uh, as the damages by the insurance company so that's a marine insurance that you will have to take for the goods and then you uh, need to take up the shipping bill as i told you shipping bill is a, a bill that is uh, given to you by your export by your company so exporter has to prepare a shipping bill uh, which may be either for free goods sometimes instead of an export license sometimes the shipping bill itself uh, will become a guarantee for goods so shipping bill is going to be given to you by uh, the company that is in charge of uh, of shipping your goods uh, another important regulatory form is your gr form so gr form is to be obtained by the reserve bank of india for any transaction that you are going to make with your importer the importer is going to pay in his or her currency so that currency needs to be uh, brought back into the country so it has to be converted into local currency so if that has to happen then it has to be done through a legal channel so that is where a gr form is issued a gr form is where uh, the once the proceeds are completed through the gr form you can get your money back and get it converted into local currency and then um, we have eppp and vp which is all exports to all the countries uh, it can be done through parcel post or through electronic post or uh, through cash on delivery channels so th these uh, these are forms so these are forms by which uh, you are agreeing upon uh, how a particular payment it's a mode of payment so you're going to decide how uh, uh, you know the payment is going to be settled so if it's going to be uh, in any of the form it's not through uh, the electronic if it's not through the banking uh, transfer then you can go in for uh, any of these so these forms will have to be taken up if the transaction specifies that the payment has to be made under any of these particular uh, uh, terms and then you have the certificate of quality that you need to take in order to create an image of quality in the foreign markets the government of india has launched a very detailed uh, program uh, for quality control and pre shipment inspection to make sure that the goods are of a good quality so there's something called pre shipment inspection that happens so all goods before they get uh, cleared by the clearing and the forwarding agents and before they get cleared from the port to get that order, order called let ship it has to go through stringent quality control and checks and only if a good gets the seal of a quality then it is allowed or permitted to be shipped and sold in the foreign markets uh, if in the case we are dealing with uh, any of the animal products or plant products or anything related to um, you know uh, living 
insects or any other living uh, you know animals as such then we need the certificate of health or sanitary certificate so that's an optional one that only that is only in the case of animal or animal goods or any or dairy related products or anything of that sort uh, which need which are, which is getting shipped then you have the packing list so the exporter must prepare an accurate packing list which will be uh, containing the list of items that are uh, that are exported the list of items and then the total quantity for each of the items all of that is going to be there so at the time when the the importer is going to take custody and then he is going to find out what has been sent by the exporter so the packing list is or well, well, packing list uh, is what he is going to be verifying so he's going to uh, check the packing list he's going to look at the commercial invoice and then he's going to physically uh, count the number of goods and check and see whether it is the same so if everything tallies that's when uh, uh, he's going to take custody of the goods and and send in a uh, an answer to the exporter stating that he has received uh, everything in full and everything is proper and fine so the other documents that needs to be accompanied are the uh, combined transport documents so which is your inland uh, doc, you know transportation and then uh, the shipping bill bill of lading all of that is going to be there so complete transportation documents will have to be included then the weight certificate uh, for the goods that you weighed so there are uh, government weighing agencies at the port so you get your goods weighed and then uh, they're going to issue a, a weight certificate so that needs to be accompanied certificate of analysis certificate of inspection certificate of shipment all of that is going to be there a copy of the impact import export code number and the rcmc certificate so all of these are going to be um, attached these are annexures that are going to be attached with uh, the primary uh, set of documents that you are going to be sending across so these are uh, a list of uh, documents that we are going to be using in uh, international business so so uh, these are those uh, very important set of documents and uh, the commercial and the regulatory documents are extremely important and uh, what makes uh, an export transaction very legal is that it has to follow uh, the procedure so that is where uh, export agencies and those uh, you know uh, executives who are involved in exporting will have to be very clear and familiar with uh, for the ways it is going to be done so that your goods don't get stuck up at any uh, point and it very clearly moves because the government has these various agencies and it has these lengthy documentation process and uh, verification process to make sure that the goods that are leaving the port are are of absolutely good quality and it is of uh, international standards and it stands for good quality because it's not just the good that is going in and it's not just the reputation of the exporter that is at stake sometimes it is the reputer of reputation of the country that is at stake so that's there to make sure that everything is done properly so it's very important that the exporter and the exporting agencies need to understand you know the the importance of doing all of this uh, in international business so next we will look at uh, the role of two important uh, organizations so somewhere in between this particular lecture we spoke about the ECGC certificate which is called the export credit and guarantee corporation so this is a body of the government that encourages export exporters and gives them a lot of credit and guarantee facilities and enables them uh, to get into the activity of exports provides them a lot of credit facilities a lot of support a lot of services that are needed so that through the ECGC exporters uh, will get that a uh, necessary knowledge get the necessary contact of uh, importers and then go ahead doing it so if in case they are uh, stuck at some point of time in executing the export delivery then uh, ecgc can step in and help them to uh, make the necessary uh, and support them and, and and clear those hurdles so let's look at what is the role of uh, ecgc so the export credit and guarantee corporation is the government of india undertaking which covers exports uh, against a lot of risks and that it faces so ecgc also provides guarantees to the financing banks to enable them to provide adequate finance to the exporter so um, ecgc stands as a guarantor or it is like a financing or a refinancing uh, agency to all the financing institutions that are uh, primarily involved in uh, funding the exporters for their export activity so this covers uh, uh, the uh, covers issued by ecgc may be classified into four categories so the standard policy issued to exporters to protect them against the risk of receiving payments while trading with overseas buyers or short term credit so to avail short term credit or uh, and also to 
cover them for the risk of non-payment by the importer after taking custody. So ECGC will cover you for that particular risk. And specific policies designed to protect Indian firms against the risk of non-payment or not receiving payment in respect of export of export on deferred payments or services rendered to foreign parties and for construction that is undertaken abroad. For uh, so the risk also covers these three different aspects. So uh, in case these three activities were uh, you know conducted and goods were uh, sold or services were rendered and if the importer has defaulted on payment or deferred on payment so or is delaying the payment so in that case ECGC will stand as a guarantee and um, you know help the exporter to overcome that particular situation. Uh, third would be financing guarantees issued to banks against the risks involved in providing credit so as I told you banks issue two forms of credit one is called the pre-shipment credit and the post-shipment credit so uh, the refinancing for both these uh, credit uh, sources will be by the uh, by ECGC. So ECGC will stand as a guarantee to the bank or which will also refinance uh, these uh, institutions so that institutions can now very freely um, help and support the exporters and they don't have to be too guarded uh, when it comes to taking that risk. So special schemes that, such as the transfer guarantee, insurance cover for buyer's credit, line of credit, joint ventures and helping uh, exporters and exporting companies to establish joint ventures and overseas investments. So, so ECGC is, uh, is going to act uh, not just as a, a refinancing and a risk covering kind of uh, institution, but it also tries to establish uh, a lot of links with foreign countries and foreign um, agencies in those countries. So similarly, like ECGC, you will have agencies or export promotion councils in those countries. So it establish, establishes connects or contacts with them and then builds a network whereby exporters of this country and the importers of that country can very smoothly, uh, you know, contact um, both these parties and then, uh, you know, business and other services can uh, be enhanced for, the, for mutual benefits as such. So basic principles on which the ECGC operates is it's, uh, it, it operates at the, by adopting the risk and then uh, ensuring that the risk is not just with one particular party but it spreads the risk and it is an exporter is uh, as a and it is a, it becomes a co-insurer along with the exporter so it stands guarantee uh, for all the work that is taken up and they and they also formulate specific policies uh, to promote exports and then small exporters policy is there for uh, uh, for smaller exporters or those companies and exporters who are entering into exports for the first time and uh, you know they have very small quantity to uh, export so so it helps in helping them to pool these exports and so that uh, you know two or three different export companies are pulling in the goods uh, ECGC will help them to uh, get that exposure of the overseas market and then enable and help them also to uh, get that taste of the success uh, in the foreign market. So financial guarantee uh, to banks, as I told you, that's another primary uh, work that it does. To meet the varying needs of the exporter, the corporation has evolved the following types of guarantees. So it provides packing credit guarantee. It provides export production uh, finance guarantee, um, you know, which primarily helps you to, um, you know, to secure a loan and then manufacture goods uh, for, for exports and keep it ready. And then export uh, post-shipment credit guarantee and then export finance guarantee, export performance guarantee, export finance overseas lending guarantees. So all of these guarantees are nothing but um, ECGC is covering up for the risks and was also providing, uh, enabling these uh, funding agencies or enabling these uh, banks which are into exports to offer exports without a lot of uh, conditions to the exporters because uh, ECGC is, is helping to cover up any of the risks or anything that can, uh, if in case it goes wrong, ECGC stands as a guarantor uh, for these activities. So it provides, so if you if you see those different uh, types of guarantees, it's a guarantee for uh, primarily all the activities that an exporter will have to take uh, when he or she is going to get into the <clears throat> activity of exporting, uh, you know, manufacturing goods and then going through the entire, all the processes that are involved for exporting commodities. <clears throat> the second very important agency that comes uh, into play is the Exim Bank. It's called the Export Import uh, Bank of India. So the Exim Bank was established in the year 1982 by the Government of India as a public sector uh, financing institution under an act that was passed by the Parliament for the sole purpose of financing, facilitating and promoting foreign trade in India. So we needed an exclusive bank. So the, the government felt that, you know, just to look at exporters and also to encourage 
more and more exports to go from our country. It's very important that we need to establish one bank that primarily takes care of the export import activities, uh, financing exporters and taking care of the, all the needs and offering services and advisory uh, that is required for exporters. So that's how the bank came into existence and the various functions of the bank, it primarily is a lending uh, agent. So it supplies credit, so it gives you suppliers credit. Uh, it provides finance for consulting and uh, technology services. It, there are you know, firms within our country which are offering those so they can avail uh, those sort of uh, you know, services. Then it offers pre-shipment credit for all the physical preparation of goods and ensuring that you once you get the order from the uh, importer, you start manufacturing. So you're buying raw materials, you're running your factory, paying wages. Uh, for all those uh, expenses, material, and overhead expenses that you're going to incur. So you get a credit called the pre-shipment credit. And then you have a finance for deemed exports for those goods uh, that were considered for exports, but uh, uh, weren't, I mean, you weren't able to sell it to the foreign country. So those goods can be considered as uh, deemed to be exports. So you get uh, goods of that particular category. So you get financing for that. And then foreign currency for uh, pre-shipment credit. Uh, so you will get the necessary financing that you require for uh, taking those taking care of those activities and then financing uh, institutions that are there or uh, export agent export companies that are in uh, export oriented uh, zones or units and then uh, those which are in epz's so there are these 100% uous 100% export oriented units so financing those units so that they are able to uh, export goods so that's uh, going to be there uh, export vendor development finance, export product development finance for all these are additional activities uh, that are taken to improve the quality and the standard of, uh, of vendors and suppliers and raw materials and input factors that go into the export process. And then overseas uh, investment finance for companies that are uh, making joint ventures or companies that are making investments or companies that are going in for a foreign investment in foreign companies, um, you know, jointly developing uh, projects or you know, doing product development so government gives you that sort of finance uh, software training institute export marketing finance and production equipment finance all of these are uh, you know services that it renders for uh, technology development for marketing assistance and for uh, you know setting up or buying assets or uh, developing assets for the sole purpose of uh, exporting goods to foreign markets so the second uh, set of services that Exim Bank uh, offers will be uh, underwriting services, services, forfeiting services, guarantee facility, line of credit transaction, and project preparatory services overseas. See, these are primarily uh, banking functions or banking services that it offers. So all of these activities are undertaken to help exporters so that all their banking necessities and then the, the specialized banking services are offered to these exporters. And for commercial banks, uh, Exim offers, uh, becomes a refinancing for all the export credit. So when commercial or scheduled banks give money for export uh, purposes, so Exim Bank uh, plays the role of refinancing them. And small scale SMEs, uh, export bills uh, get re-discounted uh, at the Exim. And then it offers refinancing for short term and long term loans. And then bulk import finances uh, facilities are there and then guarantees Guarantee come refinancing for suppliers credit are also there for uh, those suppliers who are part of the supply chain or the export, um, you know, production process. So, so that uh, support also is rendered by uh, the, by the Exim Bank. And uh, in the overseas entities, it's, it offers, uh, uh, you know, lines of credit and then it offers buyer's credit for uh, overseas entities. And then other activities of the bank include uh, export marketing fund. It has an export marketing fund. And so that money is used for setting up uh, exhibitions or trade fairs and so on for all the marketing assistance that is required by exporters and then helps Indian companies to set up subsidiaries and joint ventures abroad. And uh, it gives information of all the potential exporters to importers and importers details uh, will be shared with the exporters. Those who would be interested in, in uh, carrying over uh, you know, international business with them and then helps in preparing bids uh, if uh, auctions have to be taken care of in the foreign market for uh, many activities, especially for construction and other kind of turnkey projects, uh, bids have to be placed and term finance for developing and launching new products and uh, extends advisory and information services to exporters 
and uh, upgrades the quality standards uh, to make sure that the goods are of uh, finest quality when it is exported and then provides information from their databases, all their necessary services that uh, Exim does because of its um, wide network of contacts with various countries, wide network of contract with all contact with all the agencies that are in Export Promotion Council in the respective countries. So all of that data and information uh, is pulled in, is collected, and then uh, Exim shares that with exporters and exporting agencies so that uh, you know exporters can make the best use of this sort of information. So that brings us to the end of this particular small topic. So here we looked at the uh, set of documentation that we required and the two important functions of two export agencies. One is ECGC and then we have uh, the Exim Bank. So both these uh, are, are, uh, are like the backbones of the export uh, activity and function and uh, primarily because of these of the existence of these two important agencies, export uh, support agencies, uh, you know, of the government is the, uh, the reason why exporters can very, um, you know, breathe very freely in while they do this activity and they don't have to think a lot or worry about uh, risks and the perils and then the kind of, uh, uh, you know, the kind of risks that they will have to take and the losses that they will have to face because both these agencies definitely do their homework and then, uh, you know, and, and, and securing information from these two agencies and then going about doing everything in in a very uh, you know in the in the most advised manner by these agencies exporters tend to gain benefit of, of these activities and once uh, they get the uh, the taste of uh, international business and they know how to uh, export goods uh, through one or two transactions that they take exporters become uh, really uh, you know really confident enough of dealing with uh, you know foreign importers and then obviously uh, these agencies with their specialized services will always be there uh, to help exporters to uh, gain the benefit of international trade. Yeah, thank you.